I feel privileged to be a musician because I'm free. So to be a musician for me was, was the best decision I could do. I mean, I was 14 when it was very really clear I wanted to be a musician and I never thought about any consequences and about the risk which my parents saw, but I, I didn't see that. I, I would do it in the same way, maybe, more or less. My name is Tilman Hauptstock. I'm born in 61 and I'm born here in Darmstadt and I still live here. I'm cellist and guitarist. I both studied in the same way. I played in orchestra and with string quartet for several years. I'm a performer, a soloist and with chamber musicians. And one of my passions are teaching. I love my teaching work and I have an old company producing music scores and I have my own festival so and I have a very nice wife an Italian wife she lives in Italy my both parents have been pianists and my father was a great pianist he's not so well known but he's as one of my favorite pianists it's not because I'm the son it's it's really like that and this influenced a lot my musical life and to be honest, I should become a cellist for my father's desire. But of course, the guitar was my love. And the cello I also was my love, but much later. So when I started playing music, so the cello was more an um, obligation and, and the guitar was my own choice. <laughs> from the guitar to the cello was much more than the other way around. It's very interesting. Yeah. The cello was more important for me to, to play in a string quartet, to play in orchestra, to, to feel all this repertoire which I couldn't play on guitar. Musicians, composers or compositions that made the biggest influence on you as a musician. Oh my God. You want to you wanna get names. Okay. Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, Johann Jakob Froberger. Of course, my love was always Brahms. When I was stu studying, when I was 16, 15 years old, I listened to all the pieces I could get on Brahms and studying a lot of Brahms. Not only on the cello, but also for, for listening. There was always a period in my life I was influenced by composers like Villa Lobos or Bach always. Fernando Sor was very, very important for me for f the studies by Sor. For um, Rubato, the most important musician for me is Arthur Rubinstein. So this was my teacher uh, for, for all the rubato because he's a master shaper of, of, of rubato with never losing the, the pulsation. So the, I love this. I think it's, uh, it's everything. I think as a musician, I guess you, you need the influences of, of many, many sides.
goal, place perfection in your life. I'm German. And I don't know it's it's this cliche is right, but many people say that Germans are too too perfect. I think we Germans have the problem that we are we want to do things very good and sometimes we forget to enjoy life. And this is the problem of perfection. So when I do give an example, a recording, sometimes uh, even a very, very simple study by Sora, I need three hours maybe for a piece of one minute. And this is not so nice. So you, you, it's not uh, un grande divertimento in Italian, you say that, you know, so it's, but you are looking for something, you, you have a goal, you wanted to, you have an idea of an interpretation, you want to do it as best as possible. Sometimes the difference between the best and the, the second best is maybe a little thing. And I'm not sure that I can hear the difference after four weeks. Uh, so perfection for me is very, very important. Um, but in my life, I'm not perfect. This is my problem. When I give a concert, I do many, many mistakes. But uh, I can accept it much better than 20 years ago. So I know wonderful colleagues, great musicians, and they play so much better than I do. I play much more perfect. So I had to accept that perfection is very important for me, but I can't get it. Never. Ellen Wilcox and Franz Wertmüller is Thurman Hopstock. Is it upon the vice St. John? That's a very nice question. To be honest, I don't know it. So when I start to write in this style, the only idea was that I thought it would be nice to have another sonata from this classical area. And in the beginning, uh, there was no deep thinking about. I first wrote this sonata 25 years ago as an original guitar piece, but I had in my mind a piano. So this is the reason it's very difficult to play and there are some idioms of the piano transferred to the guitar. And many years later, I made a transcription of the piece for the piano, which is much more difficult. So, but in a way you hear on the piano what I wanted to do on guitar, which is not possible to play. And then I asked Carlo Macchione to make a transcription of the piano version. So there are three versions, the original guitar version, a piano version, and then a transcription from the piano version for guitar, which is more or less unplayable. But Carlo did a good job. So people can choose what they want to do. So what I created was also um, an original printing of two pages. I can show you later, maybe we can show you in the camera. I made two, I created, it was a lot of work, two days of work. I created original two pages from the first, first print, you know. Oh, very strange. Yes, I love to make jokes, but this, of course, it has nothing to do with a joke. I mean, this uh, the idea to create the name and the curriculum vitae, this was a kind of amusement and joke. But to write the music, of course, there is a very uh, honest and serious background. So there are two different things uh, which I have combined. So the music is, is, has nothing to do with a joke. So the, the reason that I use the pseudonym, another name, is there are two reasons. The one is that I thought when I write this music from another period, 100 years ago, under my name, nobody would be interested. So what, when you discover something, so guitarists are alike to discover, and then you see that and you see, wow, this, we need this music. But when you then hear the tooth, it's less interesting, not for everybody, for, but for some people. And this is a pity. And the other point was, um, and this is absolutely true, when I jump into the pseudonym, into another um, person, personality, it is a bit easier to write in this style. So I really thought I would be Alan Wilcox. It is something to be an actor, you know. So these are the two reasons I did it. And it made fun to me, at least to me. Describe your composing process, how you catch the ideas. So it's very banal. There is nothing special. It comes or it doesn't come. So I'm playing the guitar and something is coming out by itself or I'm thinking about 
I'm sitting on the keyboard and sometimes I make a break. So I was composing some studies, a lot, eight, nine studies in three weeks, two weeks. And then there was a barrier, a block, and I couldn't continue. And then I waited two, three months and then I continued. So there is nothing, nothing special. Because I don't see myself as a real composer, to be honest, even I wrote many pieces. What I do is to think much more about music than to play. This is what I, what I say. When I give a concert, and it's not a joke, it's true, and it's, it's a whole concert, I start to practice 10 days before and never more than one hour, one and a half hours. Because I can't do that, because with my um, capacity of my body, I can't practice four hours. So I had to learn to concentrate in, in a good way to practice. And it works pretty well, to be honest. So I think there is um, a period in your life that is normally you practice five, six hours. But the most important thing is to know to practice as less as possible. That doesn't mean that you practice one hour, but to use good four hours is much better than to use seven hours which so much stuff in it which you don't need which doesn't help when i was young until i was 23 i play always uh, by memory and sometimes i lost and i remember a concert when i played bach and i lost the piece in the concert about four or five times and then i thought stop i don't need that i want to enjoy when i play i don't want to have this this kind of pressure and up from that, I was pretty young. I, I started to play everything with score. And you know, chamber musicians do that. Harpsichord players, they play with the score. And it's normal. And I play much better with the score. The, the important thing is that you don't watch like this, that you look to the score and you look to the public, you look to your left hand. But I don't look so much to my left hand. So you need to know how to use, how to read the score, that the audience, they don't think that you are connected with the score like that, you know. And the reason is I, I save so much more time when I practice. Yeah, about all these recordings I've done with my voice and these overdubs, which I did from two, three to 16 voices. Um, this gave me a lot of fun, but not only fun, I learned a lot. I, I started doing these things about over 35 years ago, 40 years ago, and I did it during the 80s, so when I was in my 20s. And I had plenty of times because I stopped giving concerts for, for 11 years. And so I, I found this field of uh, enlarge my knowledge about music. And it's very simple because some things you never could, can do because I never sung in the choir. And so I, I created my own choir. And you learn a lot about music, about phrasing, about intonation. This is very, very important. And about good timing, about perfection, about many, many things. So this, um, for all the people I played for, they're always laughing and they're amused. But there's also a serious idea behind, you know, even that I thought it's, it's very funny. Uh, on the other side, uh, I learned a lot about music and I could develop some of my skills during this time. And I think here in this interview, I think it's the first time that some of these things are published. Uh, I will do to my 60th birthday, hopefully make a CD with all, or with a, with a selection of my productions I've done in those time. Everything is handmade and analog, so very complicated. I am next for ladies, cheap, trust, and you, good and evil, but money cannot move. I can give the fair, but for the fair to you. I mean, yes, I think for the younger generation, they cannot imagine how difficult it was to produce those recordings. And even in those times when you had it with a tape, 
you, you could get tape recorders with, with many tracks, with, with eight or 12 tracks. I had a very simple two track, two tracking recording system from Revox and a very, very pure, simple microphone. And so when you do this, when I did it in that time, so you have one track, first voice, second track, second voice, and you, with, with a headphone, you listen to your first track. And then you have to record the third track, but you only have two tracks. So what you have to do, you have to overdub the first track, so you cannot make any um, correction. So then you have three voices, but still on two tracks, and then you go back to the other, to the second one, and you have four tracks, and you're always jumping between the tracks. And when you have eight tracks, you, you, have, you, you have, always have to accept what you have done, or you have to start again by zero, what happened very often. But there is one thing I, I, I showed you, which is not here for the interview. This is radio broadcast uh, production. This took me four weeks, you know, four weeks every day, seven, eight hours. Yeah. You need a lot of time. How to play chamber music well? A very easy question and a very difficult answer. I think, to be honest, it is not a question how often you practice. This I thought before, you need to practice always together to be a good chamber musician. I think it's very important, especially when you play with two or three guitars, because it's very difficult. But in general, it has to do how good you are prepared. How good you know the other parts of the other players. That's very important. You need to know the whole score. And then to see your part in the, in the ensemble. Of course, you are very important. But importance means also to go one step behind. This, are, to me, this is, is um, the ticket to become a good musician for chamber music. It has not, not too much to do with... Uh, with, with practicing a lot. It has to do with the point of view to a group. Most of this transcription of chamber music is music I played in concerts or made, reco made recordings. So it's, 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 let's say, an experience from the player's side. And of course, when you do transcriptions of, of chamber music, you have in mind the original instruments. You know, of course, you always need. Or it's, it's, it's for harpsichord solo or it's chamber music for, for strings or for, with a singer. And of course, uh, when you, for example, you make transcriptions by Schubert songs, not everything which is possible to play on guitar is good on guitar because the idiom of the instrument is very important. So to transport the sounds of the music through the guitar is the most important thing and not what is possible to play. Explain your idea of perfect recording. Do you want to reach the ideal sounding? Yes, I really want to reach the ideal sounding, but it happens very, very rarely. Why? Because I work in my own studio. So on one side, I can do the perfect recording on the musical side. You know, I don't talk about the errors. I talk about the perfect musical idea. In this moment, I do the recording, you know. Uh, so for the musical things, it's, it's perfect for me in my studio. But when I have the chance to be in a good hall or in a fantastic church, which I found 10 years ago in Italy for a recording, um, then everything is a bit less perfect from the musical side. So it's always um, a compromise. What I'm dreaming is I have my own church, you know, and I can have my own church studio and leave the stuff and I always go there when I want to make a recording. But it's not like this. So it's a compromise. So my, most of my recordings from the view of, of the sound, you know, is, is not perfect, unfortunately. It's not as the sound is in the reality. I, I remember that I made a, re, uh, a session of 12 studies by Saul and there were some very easy pieces which we can play directly, you know, from the music score. And sometimes it took me two hours for a piece with, with 10 cuts, you know, um, until I find the really perfect phrasing. Uh, I always say it's some, my, my recordings very often are a kind of collage. but. It's very important that you cannot hear it's, it's a collage of 
of, of different things you know so it should sound as one idea you know and finally nobody asks you you know how many cuts you have done with the Paganini caprices I don't know maybe each caprice has 200 cuts I don't know how many cuts they have uh, I shouldn't say that I guess it's very important to jump into the music style of course and to know a little bit of the original instruments I think it's not so important to play them because uh, I was asked very often why you don't play the lute or why you don't play the bari guitar I never was interested I love all my colleagues they do both or play many instruments like my colleague Olaf von Gonnison who is a great player in so many fields but for me it wasn't important my challenge was how I can transfer this music to a modern guitar and to grab a little bit of the sense of, of the instrument of the player who play these instruments to listen a lot you know and I think we can transfer a spirit of this music into the modern guitar and then to combine it so it's not that I just to want to imitate I think we need to show the, the uh, advance the advantage of the modern instrument with the sense and the spirit of this old music is the same when you play um, flamenco music how can we know or think that people in those days they they also enjoyed life and when you play sons this is so wonderful or when you play divisé i think we have to understand that those people enjoy life and of course when we read the music it's it's you need to um, transcribe many things or transfer many things which are not written in the music into the instruments it's passionate it's peaceful meditative it's also religious you know it has many many aspects you know in baroque music and uh, to understand what interprets say what kind of of of, of melodies says you know they are very often there are more meanings behind but it does not mean that you only understand uh, the religious idea behind it's it's of course it's passionate <laughs> Thank you. 